Today is January 1st, 2021, in my bedroom, I guess. Um, coming off of a pretty rough year, and honestly, I have no idea what this year is about to hold. But I'm really excited. I'm really excited to look back on this editing and see all the amazing memories, all the amazing people um, I've gotten to meet, and just the incredible opportunities I've gotten over this year. I'm ready, scared and excited because I have a lot of visions, a lot of dreams, a lot of goals coming into this year and I don't know what it's going to look like, but I have faith that something's going to happen, something's going to come from it. Um, I just got to believe in my art, believe in the vision I have and those who are supposed to be there will be there to support me. So, here's the 2021. I know exactly what the basal ganglia does. There's an indirect, indirect pathway. And there's different parts of it and stuff. Bye. have to be your biggest fan and when things are really tough and they're really rough and nothing's working but there's something inside of you that says I just have to follow that because you don't know who you're gonna meet who you're gonna meet who you're gonna meet to say the very least. For those of you who are new here, my name is Andy. I am a second year medical student at the Medical College of Georgia. And if this is your first video, welcome. 
go check out some of my others. But it's really strange to know that I'm talking to a lot more subscribers and people than the last reflection recap video I did. If you guys have been around the channel for a while, you'll know that I like doing these kind of end of semester milestone-y review videos to give you guys just a raw unfiltered opinion from a student going through the process about what it's like, what I've learned, and things that you need to know before entering this stage. I did one at the end of my first semester of med school as well as the first year of med school, so now this is the 18 month kind of update. But what's interesting in my perspective is that my curriculum has an 18 month pre-clerkship stage, meaning that I'm going to rotations in January. I'm done with all my didactic stuff. And we'll get into this as the video progresses, but that has definitely some pros and cons to it. A more traditional curriculum uh, for me to go to clerkships or to be at this point in my medical training, it would be two years. So six months earlier than a traditional medical student. And I'm the guinea pig class of this new curriculum. So keep that in mind as well as we go throughout the video. Of course, I gotta put forth the disclaimer, these are all my opinions. They do not reflect my school or institution. And really, there's nothing here that will be like incredibly groundbreaking, but I think it is valuable, as you guys have seen in my past review videos, for students to have a student v student advice conversation. Not a doctor that's like been through it years and years ago trying to give advice to a medical student because there is that dis disconnect. So kind of the outline of this video and timestamps will be below in the description. I'll do the first half of it be like all the stuff inside the classroom. So um, academics wise, exams, how I studied, everything like that. And then the second part will be kind of the outside of the classroom stuff, social life, taking care of myself as well as uh, extracurriculars that we need to build as a medical student. And then finally, at the end, I'll wrap things up with some things that I think I would have liked to have done differently before going to rotations or at this stage, as well as some advice to students maybe in the middle of this process or you just got accepted into medical school and are wondering what in the world am I in for? Because this is kind of the end of a chapter for me, this will probably be a pretty lengthy one. So grab some coffee, grab some tea, feel free to listen to this like a podcast. Editing Andy will figure out some way to make this somewhat interesting. Hi, editing Andy. So without further ado, here we go. I got my phone here because I have notes on like things I need to hit. But to begin it off, I think we need some context that you need to keep in mind when I'm talking about these different subjects. One, I am not a traditional student. Again, if you've been around the channel for a while, you know that I was part of a seven year BSMD program. I started med school when I was 20 years old. So there's definitely uh, some life experience things that I just haven't been alive long enough to have. And that's not a good or bad thing, it's just different and that's why context is important. Second, my year, the class of 2024, is the first class to have primarily all their applicants in their residency cycle have their step one board exam pass fail. And again, that has a lot of pros and cons to it that I will address later, but it's something that is unique to my class just because it's the first class to really have that like pressure lifted off of us and that reflects the way we approach studying. Speaking of step, I have friends that are about to take it just because they have like a free elective block in their rotation year and so they have the available time to take step one early. Still pass fail but I don't have that early of an elective block, just the way my schedule panned out. So I'm actually waiting to take step one and step two in like a eight week period at the beginning of 2023. So this entire next year, 2022, will be all my core rotations and a couple electives. So that's a personal decision I made because I wanted to just concentrate on being the best clinician I could be without having that like overwhelming weight of holy crap I gotta study for a board exam yeah we have like miniature board exams throughout each block but just like I don't want that weight of the huge one on me immediately 
just because I've rushed through a lot of my medical training process or have like taken you know, quick steps to get to each point. And this is one thing where I want to learn from my doctors. I want to learn from my residents and my patients. And that's where I want to focus my time and energy on um, at the moment, not like trying to panic and cram for a board exam. And then lastly, for context, I am the guinea pig class of a new three plus curriculum at my medical school. If you are interested in going to the Medical College of Georgia, I highly suggest you look up what the three plus program is. Basically, we are the first class to have an 18 month pre clerkship stage which is why I'm making this kind of big bookend video reflecting on that period. And it was very much both students and faculty alike. We we're just kind of figuring it as figuring it out as we go. And uh, yeah, that goes about how you expect it to. Wing can only be so smooth. So there's a couple things that I'll hint on in my reflections where I'm like, look, we tried our best. And so with the contact out of the way, let's talk about the classroom or more academics. First thing I wanna talk about are study habits. So I said this in my previous reflection videos, but in medical school, it's really a big jump between undergrad and here. And you don't know what it means to be drinking out of a fire hose until you get here. You think you do but then you get here and you're like, oh, oh, they weren't kidding. And so I'm in agreement with a lot of the advice out there that it's not that hard, it's just quantity that's freaking crazy. And then not just that, but some of the previous study methods that you use in undergrad aren't gonna work in med school. And to be completely honest, between the blocks that you have, so we did uh, body systems for each block until like by the end of the 18 months, you've hit every single body system. The way I studied for my musculoskeletal block was way different than the way I studied for my cardiovascular and cardiopulmonary module because MSK was a lot more anatomy focused and CP heme was a lot more like physiology focused. And there's just different ways to study each of them. And I think the biggest challenge in that is just admitting to yourself that something's not working and being able to change it up really, really quick. Because a lot of med students and very smart people are very much stuck in their ways. So they'll be dead set on like, this has always worked for me, even though I'm not getting the grades and stuff right now, I'm just gonna like head first, keep doing it and it'll eventually work. No, no, you just, there's just too much that goes on in med school where if something's not working, you gotta change, you gotta switch it up. And like, it does take some time to figure stuff out, uh, what works and what doesn't work for you. So that's where I suggest studying in groups a lot because in a group setting, everybody kind of has their own method of it. And so you get like, it's like a buffet line. You get like a little bit of strategy from this person, a little bit of strategy from this person, a little bit here and there, and then You'll, you'll figure out which one works for you and then you just like adopt that into your own personal study schedule. My favorite resources were Anki, Pathoma, Sketchy, and First Aid, as well as when I ended up getting it, Amboss. All of those were amazing. Uh, the school gave us Scholar Rx too, which is like another kind of test bank question pack resource. Um, I have some thoughts on that that I'll get to in a second. But you'll know there's a ton of resources out there. Find the ones that you like, stick with it. Don't be fishing around everywhere. Um, but that first like block, that foundations block of med school, that's where you really gotta hone in on what works and what doesn't work because that does lay some of the foundation for how you study for the rest of your pre-clerkship stage. Now the exam structure is actually something that I liked and this is what my school did. In the modules, every week would be a weekly quiz uh, that was based on that week's lectures and every week had like Monday was your anatomy and physiology stuff and then like Tuesday through Wednesday was your pathophys of like what you learned on Monday and then 
Thursday was your um, your farm day. And so you'd like blitz through all of that and take a quiz on that week's stuff on Friday. And that would happen every single week up until the final. And speaking of the finals, what was really nice about our school was all of our finals weren't made by the professors. They're actually archived MBME step one questions. So these are real step one board questions that have been used on previous exams. So they compiled it all together and just kind of picked and cho choose um, questions that pertain to our current block. So if we're doing GIGU, we would only have questions on like GIGU on our final, of course. But what that is really good for is preparing you for boards because in a way boards, any standardized testing, it's all about like just learning how to take the test and being familiar with the way they ask questions, the way the boards want you to think is 90% of the battle to be completely honest. So getting used to having those questions as our final was really nice because how we would prepare for our block finals was just basically prepare like you're studying for boards, but just boards of one section. And that's something that has been a really good change compared to the class above us where all their finals were like house made, which means the professors made it. And for them, once they got to boards times and when they're on rotations, they actually really struggled because they weren't used to the questioning format. So I'm really thankful that they did that for our class. Then I think the only other big assessment, um, big assessment that's super important are your anatomy practicals. And I think those are pretty much the same for every med school. You're dissecting all throughout the block. And then you're, for me, I found it the easiest instead of like, going in the anatomy lab to study for like seven, eight hours at a time, I would go often. So I would go like every day, but only for like 30 or 45 minutes at a time to review structures because I just personally found, uh, I get really burnt out of being in the lab for a lot of time and I get like frustrated that it's not productive. The entire anatomy faculty will go in and like, put a little string around the structures they want you to identify and you you get a minute to figure it out and you don't get to go back to that station. So uh, you either know it or you don't. And that's how it works. So I have on my notes grading and that's something that I kind of want to stress and something I've been a big advocate of, especially talking to other med schools and med students from other places. What has been really nice uh, that was fought for us by, I believe, the class of 2020 was switching to a pass-fail pre-clerkship curriculum, meaning that everything up until, you know, you go to rotations is just pass-fail. And that has been one of the most underrated blessings of my med school experience because it allows you to... One, study without the stress. Uh, two, it cuts down on a lot of the like very traditional med school toxicity of like, hey, I'm gonna try to sabotage you and step over you just so I can be like one or two ranks ahead of you. And like that has never been good. Uh, medicine is all about cooperation, both with other physicians as well as other members of the medical team, whether it be nurses, PTs, OTs. Uh, etc. So that pass fail curriculum really, really, and I cannot emphasize this enough, really made an impact on our mental health as students. If you are at a school that is, does not have a pass fail pre clerkship curriculum, you guys need to have that conversation with your admin because there have been many, many studies that have shown benefits to it. And like our class is a case study of what can happen. There's literally only good that can happen from that uh, because I get to study because I want to learn the information not for points and that mindset change as like much as you want to say that only happens when like you don't have it another option <laughs> you know stress of the coursework it's med school it's hard there's a lot a lot of concepts and in general, like at the end of it, you're simply just not going to know everything. And I think the sooner you admit that to yourself, 
the better your life is going to be. That doesn't mean that you get complacent and just like do the bare minimum, but like don't beat yourself up for not knowing something. I think all of the doctors and attendings that I've talked to have said the best thing that you can tell them is I don't know. Because if you get, let your pride get in the way of things and you try to like spit off some random answer, one, you make the situation worse. And two, you just deprive that preceptor or faculty member a learning or a teaching opportunity and you a learning opportunity. So it's cliche, but just be a sponge, uh, soak up what you can, try to remember as much as you can, but do not beat yourself up if you forget something because it happens. And then finally, how well do you feel prepared? I think I'm pretty prepared for clerkships because I think the way that our preclinical years were set up was very much not just to get you a good knowledge base, but also have a heavy, heavy emphasis on being a good clinician. Now, here's what I mean by that. One of the cornerstones of our new curriculum was something called case-based learning. And some people have that like one case every month, one case every two weeks. We had a case every single week. So we would meet with our eight person group three times a week with a, either an MD, like physician or a PhD preceptor. And it would be a real case that came through our healthcare system. Of course, the names are changed and like things are de-identified, but you would get like the chief complaint, history, physical exam uh, on day one. And your job as the group is to think about a differential diagnosis, think about what labs uh, and testing you need to order, uh, consider the patient in this situation, how can they like afford these medications, these tests, how can they get to the hospital, a lot of the socioeconomic stuff, uh, which I love. And then by the end of the week, come to a conclusion and treatment plan for this patient, and then kind of see how your thought process went along with how the case actually went in real life. But what that does is it trains you to think like a doctor because it's not just algorithmically it's not oh here's this ailment this is what i do here's this this is the lab test i order it's here's your case what are you thinking and then based off of what you're thinking what tests do i order to either direct me one way down the differential or another and then once you get there what else do i need to do now to branch it out even further until I narrow things down and get to a conclusion. That is how we were trained to think. And that is why I think our class is so prepared to go to the wards and actually see patients, even though we've done it in literally six months less time is because there's not, there's less of an emphasis on spinning out facts, but more, how do I connect the dots? and even if I don't know what exactly this, this is, or maybe I forgot what this is, I have the skill set to one, identify things that could possibly kill the patient. So let me identify those and make sure I don't miss that. But two, let I have the skill to gather all the necessary information to get to that conclusion and that diagnosis or treatment plan. So that way I can get all the information, take it back to the medical team, my attending, present it in an orderly fashion. So that way we as a team can get to the bottom of this. That on top of heavy emphasis on standardized patients, that helps sharpen our interpersonal skills because it doesn't matter if you're an encyclopedia, if you don't know how to translate that information or communicate effectively as an empathetic caregiver to a patient, you're not a doctor. So yes, this, these past 18 months in terms of like raw content has been a stupid, ridiculous amount of information going at Mach 10 every single week. But what that does do is really forces us to connect dots very early because I've been told this by doctors and I truly believe it myself because I've had evidence of it in my own life 
You remember stories and you remember experiences. You remember patience more than you remember a standardized question in a textbook or an Anki card. So getting us prepared to see patience instead of focus on getting the highest score on a board exam, I think has been one of the most rewarding and like in the process, I didn't realize what was happening, but especially near the end of this, when I had my like end of year standardized patient stuff where we were, we basically had like four weeks straight of, Hey, there's a standardized patient in that room. You have no idea what it's going to be. You have no background information. Here's a chief complaint. Go in that room. You have 15 minutes to get a history and a physical exam. You come out, you write a note, and you go back in and present to your attending the patient as well as a possible differential and then a plan. You think you don't know a lot. And then you walk in there and you do it and you sit down and you're like, holy crap, I, wow. Maybe I do know something. And you don't, you won't realize that until you're at the end of this period, because all you know for a good chunk of it is textbooks, practice questions, and that's not bad, but it's not as rewarding as, you know, just putting it all out there in a real situation. And trust me, there are many times where I even question are we even gonna be prepared to go uh, to clerkships? But after seeing everybody and myself go through this whole process, this, I mean, experiment for less of a, you know, yeah, we, we were experiments and come out actually pretty successful. I think it feels good, it feels good. That was a very long winded answer for everything we did in the classroom and everything that we had to go through as part of like the raw academics has prepared us to go to clinicals. Pause, before we get into the reflections of the outside of the classroom stuff, as well as some lessons for the future, as well as prospective medical students, I wanna take a second to thank the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. If you guys haven't heard of Skillshare, Skillshare is an online learning community filled with literally thousands of personally curated courses on topics ranging from art, personal finance, to entrepreneurship, and so, so much more. Anything that you've wanted to pick up, learn, or pursue, there's a lesson on it. I know a lot of you guys watching are students or are current students, and I'ma just tell you one thing from a med student. Life is all about lifelong learning. You're never gonna stop learning. If there is a certain skill that you've always wanted to try out or always wanted to pick up, Skillshare is one of the best places to start. One of the courses I personally use, as well as I've recommended this to so many people because I get a lot of people asking me like, how do I start a YouTube channel and everything, is a course from one of my all time favorite YouTubers, Dan Mace. It's called Filmmaking for All and I highly recommend to anybody who wants to start a YouTube channel or just get into filmmaking or storytelling via video at all. Because there is never a better time to start learning a new skill than now, I've teamed up with Skillshare to offer you guys watching, or more specifically, the first thousand of you that click the link in the description or the pinned comment below to get a one month free trial of their services, meaning that you get access to all their lessons that have no commercials and are all tailored to your learning. Over the holidays, if you're sitting at home with your parents wanting to pick up a new skill while you got the time, Use Skillshare, click the link down below to get that one month free trial and shout out to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and supporting this channel. Okay, now for, I guess a little bit more of the fun stuff, at least in my opinion, the things that were cool outside the classroom. So I have here, how easy is it to get extracurriculars? Uh, very, very, very much. I think completely honest, in my opinion at least, it was easier to find extracurriculars in med school than it was in undergrad, which is 
weird to think about because you think of undergrad as like you have endless opportunity there's so many different people but i think once you're in med school you are surrounded by a lot of people that think like you uh, have the same passion and mission as you and i think because of that you don't have to look very far for people that share your same goals so it was very very easy and i always tell people if there's something you're interested in or passionate about you're going to find it in med school and not just that but you'll find an organization that can incorporate whatever passions you had into your medical training i've always been a proponent of keeping your creative passions going into med school just because a lot of people are like oh once i get in here i gotta give up everything and med school will become my life and that's just not true or at least it shouldn't be true i started a media group which has now progressed to like quite literally a company but that's besides the point i think that it was just cool because i found doctors that had the same passion as me in media and then that turned into me doing a lot of stuff with simulation education as well as uh, a lot of promotional stuff for the school and then not just that but i was able to get other people who had the previous photography videography skills and bring them onto projects and not just like bring them on but to get them paid and that was really really cool i got to teach people how to kind of freelance in a way especially because people have these skills but a lot of them didn't freelance uh before med school so it's a valuable skill to have and to learn. Another one is uh, music and medicine and our acapella group, the Serotonins, who are absolutely one of the just talent powerhouses. Um, they perform at all of our big events and they're just so, so talented. You're probably seeing a video of them on screen, but really, they've taken their passion for singing or the skill for singing and turned it into something that is truly beautiful and can uh, really display how well-rounded we are as a class to family, faculty, etc. Then of course, if you're really passionate about public health or health policy, we've had a lot of organizations like the AMA chapter here and um, also one, Black Men MCG, I work with them a ton uh, because they've created such an powering community if there is an initiative or something you're passionate about uh, whether it be directly medical related or not you can find it of course there's interest groups and um, free clinics that you can work at which i was a part of a couple uh, i with youtube and everything i didn't get involved uh super super closely i just volunteered when i could but you could go all the way up to being a clinic coordinator where you are literally the head honcho in charge of uh, clinics, whether it be free mental health clinic, um, equality clinic, which um, helped out the LGBTQ plus community here, um, Clinica Latina, which uh, specialize in care to the Latinx community, and they have one of the biggest interpreter programs uh, around, as well as the Asian clinic, uh, faith care clinic that I was a part of, uh, and you name it, it's there. Uh, next, what kind of extracurriculars were available? I kind of touched on that, uh, but I have here what I did versus what other people did. And I, I kind of have been rambling on about it over the past couple of minutes where I chose things that I was passionate about. I did a lot of media projects with different departments, department anesthesia, department of simulation education. I did a whole thing for Clinical Latina, as well as I am a big proponent of just like helping prospective medical students come in and feel excited about it. So I'm a tour guide. I made the tour guide video virtual tour that um, is shown to all the applicants that come in. As well as, of course, I was part of free clinics, multiple organizations, and also I was on my class exec board as the historian. So I ran all the social media pages as well as I got photos and video of all of our events for our personal records. But I think the main focus is do what you're passionate about. Don't force yourself to do something that you don't like just because you think it'll be good on your CV because residency programs see right through that. And you'll be wasting your time if you don't enjoy it. Like, come on. Uh, was it easy to balance things? Uh, yes. And the reason for that is mostly in part to our schedule. So the way everything is set up, I mentioned that Every week we have our lectures and then we have on Friday our quiz at like one o'clock in the afternoon. But because it's on a Friday, once that quiz is over, your week is over, you're done, uh, which is really, really nice. It's not like 
crap, Friday, you know, Friday lectures end and now we have to study for something on Monday because then there goes my weekend. I have to study over the weekend. But uh, with our quizzes being on Friday, we as a class kind of collectively made a effort to just decompress on the weekends, relax. And that has been super helpful um, because we were all kind of in it together. And uh, my friends, we would always try to do something on the weekends, like literally anything but school, because like Monday through Friday is just the grind. Uh, but once that quiz is over, you're free. So that added a lot of structure to my schedule so that I could fit in the things that I'd like to do, you know, these YouTube videos, uh, where I just film and edit on the weekends. And then that way I had a hard rule of I never edited anything on the week uh, or during the week. and. That way it kept me accountable to studying as well as just like set boundaries on how to balance it, but not like, you know, not overindulge per se. Again, emphasis on what you do outside the classroom, especially for the, okay. Uh, in my notes, I have a note here um, because I think it's very, very important, especially to anybody who is either in the class of 2024 or any med student in the future. So class of 2024 and on especially for the next three to five years, focus on extracurriculars. And what I mean by that is because step one, moving to pass fail, I've talked to a lot of program directors um, about this. They have no idea what to do right now because like, this is their first time trying to gauge students without that benchmark. And then yes, yeah, step two, the reason why I say three to five years is because eventually, that bell curve will normalize for step two, where that becomes a new step one. And so that way programs can be like, hey, this score right here on step two is the cutoff. Uh, this has been proven to be like a quality score, uh, but because historically they just don't have the data for everybody giving their all on step two. And that kind of like skews the way programs judge you right now. And especially for my class, that means it's gonna be mostly extracurriculars that distinguish us between me from one school and another applicant from another. And so that uh, with kind of just taking advantage of our pass fail pre-clerkship curriculum, where you didn't really have to focus on trying to get 99s on everything. It was like, okay, I don't feel like I'm wasting my time doing an extra night in the clinic or I don't feel like I'm taking time away from my study by picking up a research project or something because in the long run, that research project is going to benefit me way more than trying to get an A on every single assignment because the programs are just gonna see a pass or a fail for this period of my med school training. So what is gonna distinguish me from another applicant is what I've done not grade wise. So I really wanna emphasize that go really hard in leadership positions, um, extracurriculars. And I, I forgot to mention research. So kind of going back to my statement of don't force yourself to do something you don't like. I made a whole video on this. Uh, check it up here if you want to see it. But I'm not the biggest fan of research for many, many reasons. And there is definitely a time I wanted to do orthopedics, which is a highly competitive specialty that needs a lot of research to kind of be a good applicant. And I had to make the decision for myself that I don't wanna put myself through something that I absolutely hate to get there. Like, it's just, there's gonna be a lot of people that will push you towards a competitive specialty, especially in med school. And it's okay to like, not have your heart set on that. And again, that's not, do not take that for subtle. Do not take what I just said for do the bare minimum. Because again, the general public, they don't know what the medical training process is like. They think that the internal medicine doctor, the family med doctor, the pediatrician, the psychiatrist are like the bottom of the bare applicants, but that is just simply not true. I have met so many very, very smart people in my med school class that could probably be neurosurgeons one day, but their heart is set on primary care and serving patients in that situation and advocating for them there. So don't let other people force you into doing like research 
because they want to be a competitor in a competitive specialty or like a specialty where research is weighed heavier than yours. Like don't let them sway your opinion. Obviously I think it is smart to do some sort of research, do a poster publication, a, um, a peer review publication if you can in a lab. Uh, clinical research is a big option that you can have as a medical student as opposed to an undergrad where you're doing a lot of bench work, some micropipetting and stuff. There are options uh, for research and in most academic med school, well, God, if you're in med school, you're at an academic institution, duh. It's not that hard to find research projects. I would just recommend go through the residents, not the attendings, the residents, because the residents all have projects that are just kind of sitting there. And so like, that's where they need your help. But the problem is they won't advertise it and they normally, or sometimes won't tell their higher ups in the department that they have a project. So befriend some residents and ask around if they have a paper or a you know project that needs completing and hop on it. Easy way to get research and that way you don't have to start from scratch. But if there is a specific project you wanna start from scratch, it's also a pr process that you can um, do in med school. I've had a lot of people do that and it's awesome. And then one thing that I want to mention just because like it is my channel and these are my experiences, um, as part of the things I got to do outside of the classroom was this, YouTube. Um, and I, it, it's been, it was hard. It was definitely hard juggling this but again I've I have a heavy emphasis I've learned to have a heavy emphasis on the things you do outside the classroom just because that's how we're going to be judged when we apply to rotations and I was scared at first I thought that residency programs weren't going to take what I was doing seriously I was afraid some old jaded doctor was going to be on the admissions committee and look at my paper and be like What's a YouTube? What's a subscriber? But then I ended up talking to a lot of my advisors, a lot of my mentors who are program directors here. And then through my connections with YouTube, got to talk to program directors at other institutions. And I asked them like, what do you guys think about like media work and social media stuff? And they said, in fact, it is one of the coolest things you can do as long as you do it right. Um, and what I mean by that is like, they can see the reason why you do it. And if you put it on your CV, they are going to look like if you put a link down there, don't think that they're not going to click on it and go look at your stuff. Cause they will, <laughs> they really will. But with that being said, you know, they're, they see right through the people that make a podcast or make like a channel or Instagram page, whatnot, just to put it on their CV. Um, and they can also tell somebody that is doing it for the right reasons, um, treats it as an art, is really committed to um, both sharing authentic, intimate stories, but educating people on the process of um, med school and kind of peeling back the veil of what we go through on a daily basis. My advice is the same to uh, everyone who wants to start a social media page revolving around med school, pre-med stuff, is do it for the right reasons. If you're doing it just to get famous or like make money, they will see that instantly. And that's where things can go wrong. Um, but everybody that I've talked to has just been so, so, so supportive. And I thank uh, my institution for that because I know there are probably med schools and places where it probably wouldn't have gone as smoothly with them, but they've welcomed me with open arms. They've invited me to do a lot of things um, and people find it valuable. So any of you guys wanting to do that um, as part of your CV in med school, again, don't just do it to do it, do it for the right reasons. But my point is you're not wasting your time doing something that is not exactly the traditional extracurricular activity because all of these, they count as publications on my CV, which is really, really cool. So in general, I think one of the most important things you need to do outside of the classroom though, is to make connections both with your fellow students and residents 
doctors as mentors um, because they will one day, as weird as it seems, be your future colleagues. It doesn't have to be as extreme as what I've done where I got to like fly out to different places to meet doctors at different institutions to interview them. But you know, before I even got the chance to do that, I was you know sending emails to people that were in specialties I was interested in and I just wanted to pick their brains, um, ask them about how to be a successful applicant and not just that, but kind of see how their personality was because, you know, like I say in the origin of my 73 question interview series, picking a specialty is very much a personality matchup. And I hate to say it, but it's true in this world that it's all about who you know a lot more than uh, what you know. And that's that's a very sad reality. Um, but I kind of have to warn you, don't, don't hate the player, hate the game. And sometimes this is a game you have to play. But I never really treated it as a game. It was just like advice and things that I was already doing uh, that I picked up along the way. And I'm telling you, it means the world when you can have like, one of your mentor's phone numbers after a long week, just like call them up or text them and be like, oh my gosh, like look what happened. Because they understand, they know what it's like to be a med student. They know what it was when they, they were going through it and they sympathize with that. Um, but at the same time, they have a lot more years of experience and wisdom to hand down to you. So don't deprive them of that teaching opportunity. There will be some faculty members you click with and some that you don't, but those that you click with, hold on to them tight because I'm telling you, I've, I've literally had mental breakdowns in like practice simulations and had my preceptor just like hug me and hold me because I, I needed it then. Um, but those are the people that make this journey worth it. And those are the people that you learn from because I model how I am in the patient room after them. I model the way I present myself and talk to other people, um, both as a man and a future physician after my mentors. So choosing good mentors and finding good mentors is so, so important in med school. And then to round out the outside of the classroom stuff, I wanna superficially talk about just like social life opportunities, uh, relationships, time off, etc. just because I'll make this quick, but whoever said you can't have fun in med school, uh, they're lying. You can. Uh, I, I think some classes are better than others. I would definitely say that. But in my experience, and this might be just because the class of 2024 was the COVID class and we like entered in at a really, really weird time and trauma bonded together um, because we just like couldn't see each other for a while. I think we were the most cohesive and like the most camaraderie oriented class that I, I'm gonna selfishly say that my med school has ever seen. Like genuinely, I love everybody in my class. Um, and like I said, that we try to take weekends off throughout the entire course. And it's nice to have other people kind of backing you up with, yeah, take that time off. Let's go, let's go grab something to eat. Uh, like in a 12, 14 hour study session preparing for finals and we're all like burnt out. We just pick up and be like, hey, let's let's go. And then when, when things are over, we organize, you know, class get together, somebody hosts, we have food, we have hangouts. And like, there is just, these are the memories that I'm, I'm gonna take with me and I'm gonna t tell my kids and you know, my patients maybe. It's so much fun. And again, with the cliche sayings, but there's no such thing as you don't have time. You make time for the things that are important for you and the things that you need. And my class made the time to have fun and decompress. Um, so I think you definitely should too. That has been one of the biggest proponents of me staying sane throughout these 18 months. All right, I'm almost done rambling, but I got a couple, couple things um, I wanna say. This section I titled, Things That I Would Do Differently. And there are definitely some, uh, it was not, it was not all easy. Okay. Well, like to be honest, none of it was easy. I don't say I had many regrets, but there are definitely things that I 
think I would have done differently um, that anybody that's going through this process or wants to go through this process, uh, listen to this, you'll need to hear it. First thing I would do differently, I this is for my people who use Anki. I should have kept up with Anki a little bit better and learned to use it more effectively. To be completely honest, I didn't even learn how to use filter decks until like my last two or three modules and I should have done that from a very long time. I didn't really know how to effectively use tags for a while. Um, and then I think I would have paced myself a little bit better with Anki because it is an everyday thing. It gets pretty overwhelming. And I went hard on Anki during my first block. And when I mean hard, I was on average doing like 13 to 1400 cards a day, which people in their board's dedicated time don't even do that. Um, and because of that, I was so freaking burnt out by the end of that module. That was my first block. It was a decision I had to make where I was like, I can't do this anymore. So I tapered back. But because of that, I, I think I like overcompensated and tapered back too much. And so like my next block, that was MSK uh, and CP Heum, like, or no, it was MSK skin. I don't remember as much of that block as the other ones because I like completely, I, I almost entirely dropped Anki then. Um, and I, I kind of regret it because I can tell what blocks I effectively use Anki in based off of how much I remember. And specifically MSK, I know I'm gonna have to go through a ton because I didn't use Anki a lot. Um, and that was like refractory to me being burnt out. So I think I should have paced myself a little bit more. Next, I would have definitely studied with more people. I think um, just the type A in me, I ended up studying in isolation a ton. And because of that, it's like, sometimes I didn't even know what I didn't know. And I found a lot of my classmates that study in groups and quiz each other actually did a lot better. And I just like, I don't know, I didn't have that plan. And to be completely honest, I get distracted when I'm studying with people, either that or I just end up talking. As you can tell from this video, I talk a lot, but I think I, I would have wanted to study with more people just to bounce ideas off of uh, a lot more. Because I think like those, even the times that I did, those memories stick in my head a lot more than when I was studying here at this desk all alone. Next, uh, I, I should have figured out what test bank resources I liked and then just kind of stuck with it instead of flip-flopping. Um, the school gave us Scholar RX, uh, which was like, it was good, but I don't think it accurately portrayed how step one questions actually are. And I don't think I exactly realized that until like two or three blocks of using it. Uh, and this was before I got Amboss um, or UWorld. And I should have, to be completely honest, been using Amboss for most of the time. I probably would have done a lot better on my final exams if I just did Amboss, just because I didn't realize how, how much more accurate it was than Scholar X. And I use Scholar X to be completely honest because it was free. I had to pay for Amboss and it's not cheap. So that's why I was trying to hold off as long as possible before getting, <laughs> getting Amboss. And um, yeah, I should have just, I should have just stuck with one instead of flip-flopped. Ooh, this is a good one. I should have used practice questions way more than I actually did. Again, kind of like, Going off, we didn't get Scholar X question bank until after our first module. So I didn't start incorporating practice questions until um, after my first block. But practice questions, practice questions, practice questions is the way you succeed because it even it's better than Anki because it ties in knowledge because there are so many times when I'm doing practice questions where I'm like, I get the answer wrong and I see the uh, explanation and I look at it and it just described differently or it like appeared clinically differently than it showed up on my Anki card. And it was one of those realizations where I was going, oh wait, that's what that's called? Or that's what that means? And I should have done a lot more practice questions uh, earlier on than I did. I think personally, I would have done like a couple questions each day throughout the module, even though I knew like I wasn't going to know everything at the beginning, I would have just taken notes on the things that I didn't get right because eventually throughout the module, I was gonna cover that material because what I did was like, I was just trying to get all the information in my head throughout the, the block and then just 
cram out a ton of practice questions near the end as finals review. And I don't think that was as effective as I wanted it to be, to be completely honest. Uh, oh, another good one. Enjoy the anatomy lab a little more. I don't think I realized how cool the anatomy wa lab was until I left it. Because when you're in there and they're like five, six hour dissections, you're tired, your feet are sore. I can't isolate the brachial plexus to save my freaking life. Everything looks the same. You're looking for a structure that is literally this small. You've been in there with your group. Everybody's angry, hungry, smells like formaldehyde. In the moment, all you can think about is how can I get out of here faster? But I think looking back on it now, there, there's a reverence that you have for that process where unless you're going surgery, that's like the last time you're going to hold like a lot of those organs in your hands. And it's a very surreal experience uh, that you only get once. So I would have definitely enjoyed that process and complained a lot less if I had to go back. Okay, and finally, because I know this video is horrifically long already, uh, these are my advices to the future medical student. Uh, whether you wanna be here or you're in the process of applying or you just got your letter saying you got accepted uh, and you're looking forward to the days to come, this is my advice to you. One, please don't study before going into med school. Don't study during the summer before med school. You're gonna get wrecked either way. You're just not gonna know everything, seriously. Don't waste your time. Enjoy, go travel, spend time with friends, family, because once you get here, time will be limited. And very often in my own experience, a lot of your friends who aren't in the med field just simply won't understand what you're going through. So just while you're free, and I hate to use that word because it sounds like we're being held captive here, we're not. Um, enjoy. Please don't study before coming to med school. You'll do more than enough of that once you get here. Two, and again, this is, this is advice towards class of 2024 and beyond. Don't feel pressure to take your boards early because some, some schools will let you. Uh, some people are gonna do it. Um, they're gonna take it early, but if you don't want to, or if you don't feel comfortable doing it, then don't. Everybody learns at their own pace. Um, some people have other focuses. I know a lot of uh, my friends have families. They have a wife, kid. Like, they're not trying to rush through this whole thing. And when they go to rotations, there'll be exams too. But they're trying to, they're trying to be the best student doctor clinician they can be. And like, I just to be. This is again personal bias. I just don't see the sense in rushing it. Uh, if you do feel prepared take it by all means. It's not a bad thing. But for the people that may not want to, either that or like they they probably would pass it if they took it early, but they just want to enjoy the ride, don't feel bad for making that decision. Next, I hinted at this earlier, make connections and build relationships with mentors and your classmates. They are going to be people that you're going to keep in contact with for the rest of your lives. Um, They're also going to be your future colleagues. And everybody in med school has their own unique experiences and stories. Learn from them. Don't compete with them. Learn from them. Because you're going to be a better doctor at the end of the day because of it. And seriously, they will be the key to not losing your ish in some of those tough times. Um, because sometimes you just need a rent. Nobody is going to understand what you're going through more than the people sitting in the seats to your left and right. Next bit of advice, always remember to shadow or get clinical experience, especially in the preclinical stage, because all you will be familiar with most of the time are textbooks, practice questions. You are going to get burnt out, but you have to go see the end goal keep the big picture in mind what you're training to do go shadow in different specialties go volunteer at a free clinic and talk to a patient because that's when you realize all this all this is worth it 
And that's how I got out of a lot of my funks where I would just hate sitting down here every day. I'm going, why? Why do I do this? Why do I put myself through this? But then when you go see a patient and talk to them and hear that they're looking to you for help, that's when you're like, that's, that's why. That's why I sit down here and study. And finally, cliche, but please enjoy the journey. And this is, this is me telling myself because this only happens once. You're only gonna be a preclinical student in med school once. And as excited as I am for the next chapter, uh, I don't think I fully like, grasped the blessing I had to be here um, because it was always what's next, what's next, what's next. And it always takes these videos to remind me just how cool this is. More advice to myself that is also advice to you. Remember, you know so much more than you think you do. It's med school. You cram the top 1% of every single university into one place. You're gonna feel dumb. You're gonna feel stupid. But that doesn't mean you are. Trust me, if you got here and if you got to the end of, end of this process, that information is here. All the training and knowledge to be a great doctor is already up there. What the next step is in the clinical rotations is now getting that knowledge out there. How do I take it from here to here? Your job going into the clinical rotations and this entire 18 months or two years, whatever your med school setup may be, your job in preparing for clinicals is not to know everything because you aren't. Your job is to, one, show up every single day when you get to the wards with a willingness to learn and an attitude, an attitude of a servant to truly be serving not just the medical team you're working on, but the patients. You're a student doctor at that point. So your patients are first priority. As long as you show up with that attitude and willingness to learn and the willingness to admit that you're wrong to your attendings and let them teach you, that's more than they could ask from you as a medical student. Because this is where the growing process is, right, right in this next stage. This is where all the oversight, your attendings, your residents, your fellow students, and yes, your patients will teach you more more in probably one month than you would have learned in the past five months of the preclinical stage. Those patients and lessons when you're actually going through it, when you're actually seeing what you read in a textbook for real, that's gonna stick. So you don't have to know everything going in. As long as one, you can identify the things that would kill a patient and make sure that you can alert somebody or take immediate action. And two, have the skills necessary to gather the appropriate information to get to the bottom of it. Uh, and three, and most importantly, as long as you have these skills to enter in that patient room with empathy uh, and confidence that you can help them, you're already successful. No matter what happened the past 18 months or two years, you're ready. If you're here at the very end of this, thank you. Um, this has been a crazy year. Uh, the next time I make one of these videos will be December of 2022. And it will be after all my clerkships, all my rotations. So, uh, it's probably going to be longer than this one and it's going to be way crazier, but truly I'm, I could not be more excited for the next chapter. And I, I do feel prepared. Thank you all for watching or listening. For all the support you've given to this channel, to the doctors that I've had on this channel, and just like being a part of what made my preclinical stage so amazing. I hope that you guys learn something every time that I put a video out and it's helping somebody. And I can't wait to share the new stories, the new exciting experiences uh, that clinical rotations will have to offer uh, in the coming year. So. Thank you guys. Uh, have a safe and happy holidays. And uh, here's to a leap of faith being very much taken.